Good evening, everybody. This is Thomas Felder. Welcome to another edition of The Great Controversy. Tonight we are reading um, chapter 35. It's called Liberty of Conscience. Chapter 35, Liberty of Conscience. And let's see, you should be able to see. Can you see the text on the screen, Fred? You can? You cannot? All right, then. Here we go. Let's make sure you can see the text. Can you see the text now? Got it. All right, good deal. All right, so before we go too far, let's just pray in. I'm going to uh, turn my camera off because uh, I don't know what my hair looks like today. So let me just turn my camera off or pray and come right back. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for another awesome Sabbath day. We thank you for the opportunity to read from this book called The Great Controversy, Father. We just ask that you give us wisdom, open our eyes that we might see, open our ears that we might hear. And give us a heart, dear Father, that longs to follow your will and your way. We ask these and so many more blessings in your holy son, Yeshua's name. Amen, amen, and amen again. All right, so here we are. We've been on this particular chapter. I think this is three weeks now. I think this is our third week. We should be able to finish tonight. Uh, it's only 10, 10 paragraphs. And the name of this paragraph uh, chapter, again, is called Liberty of Conscience. This is chapter 35. There are only seven more chapters left, and then we're done with the great controversy. Uh, we're about to share some important information on this one coming up, though. Uh, Brother Fred, do you feel like reading first? Certainly. All right. A striking illustration of Rome's policy toward those who disagree with her was given in the long and bloody persecution of the Waldenses, some of whom were observers of the Sabbath. Others suffered in a similar manner for their fidelity to the fourth commandment. The history of the churches of Ethiopia and Assyria is especially significant. Amid the gloom of the dark ages, the Christians of Central Africa were lost sight of and forgotten by the world. And for many centuries, they enjoyed freedom in the exercise of their faith. But at last, Rome learned of their existence, and the emperor of Abyssinia was soon beguiled into an acknowledgement of the pope as the vicar of Christ. Other concessions followed. An edict was issued forbidding the observance of the Sabbath under the severest penalties. But papal tyranny soon became a yoke so galling that the Abyssinians determined to break, break it from their necks. After a terrible struggle with the Romanists were banished from their dominions and the ancient faith was restored. The churches rejoiced in their freedom and they never forgot the lesson they had learned concerning the deception, the fanaticism and the despotic power of Rome. Within their sol solitary, solitary realm, they were content to remain unknown to the rest of Christendom. All right, let's read this next paragraph and then we're gonna go backwards and kind of talk a little bit about what you just read. So if you can continue. The churches of Africa held the Sabbath as it was held by the papal church before her complete apostasy. While they kept the seventh day in the obedience to the commandment of God, they abstained from labor on the Sunday in conformity to the custom of the church. Upon obtaining supreme power, Rome had trampled upon the Sabbath of God to exalt her own. But the churches of Africa, hidden for nearly a thousand years, did not share in the apostasy. When brought under the sway of Rome, they were forced to set aside the true and exalt the false Sabbath. But no sooner had they regained their independence than they returned to obedience to the fourth commandment. All right. So these churches that they're talking about in Ethiopia, these are, are people who settled in Ethiopia after um, Jerusalem was destroyed. Abyssinia is just another name for Ethiopia. But these are also the people who were descendants of Solomon and Bathsheba, right? Sorry, strike that. Solomon and the queen of Sheba, the queen of Sheba. Bathsheba is the one that David was with. But the queen of Sheba, remember she came and 
She came to Solomon and inquiring about certain things. So Solomon sent her descendants back to Ethiopia. He sent her with a special gift, a little pouch, right? A baby. And he sent her with priest. Many people believe that in Ethiopia, they're still holding or hiding the Ark of the Covenant, right? And so I want you to understand that these people in, in Ethiopia had a very pure religion, a very pure religion where they kept the Sabbath all the way back to the time of Solomon. The Ethiopian empire all the way up to uh, Haile Selassie was able to trace their emperors. It was the longest train of emperors ever in the history of mankind that people were able to trace. Okay. So let's take a look at this. These, these Sabbath keepers in Africa. Let's go look at Revelation 12. I want to show you something that your church hasn't shown you before. Revelation chapter 12. In Revelation chapter 12, we have John the Revelator is speaking prophetically, speaking prophetically. And he says, and when the dragon saw that he had cast, that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. Right? It says the dragon saw he had been thrown down to the earth. He chased the woman who had given birth to the child. All right, let's go. Let's maybe I need to go up a little bit so you know who the child is. All right, here we go. Let's go up to verse nine. And it says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Do you know that at the beginning of the Bible? Right before Adam and Eve came about, there was war in heaven. Right, the Bible talks about in the book of Isaiah how uh, one third of the angels got kicked out of heaven because they follow Satan in, in Isaiah chapter 14. This is not that casting out, this is a whole different casting out. Right, so there was some great war in heaven after Satan rebelled, Lucifer, but Lucifer still had access to heaven. Remember in the book of Job, where Lucifer comes when all the sons of God, which were representatives of the different worlds, came to, to God's presence, and they sat around a council table and, and talked about whatever things going on in the universe. Satan was there. Go look in Job 1 and Job 2, right? So after Christ was crucified and was resurrected, the question of whether or not Satan had betrayed the father and betrayed the son. That question had been answered. From the time the angels had rebelled until the time Christ was resurrected, some of the angels were still on the fence. They didn't know if, if, if uh, Lucifer was getting a bad rap or not. So after Christ resurrects from the dead, Lucifer is now forever kicked out of heaven. He is banished from heaven, and he can no longer come as the representative of earth. Remember when Adam, Adam was the representative of earth, he was given dominion over, over earth. When Adam and Eve sinned, they lost their dominion. Satan or Lucifer, I guess Satan, I, I'm not going to give him no props tonight. Satan becomes the landlord of earth. Up until the time Christ successfully completed his mission and resurrected. So Christ, the Bible says, becomes the second Adam. He now regains dominion of earth, and, and Satan loses his access key to heaven. He can no longer come as earth's representative because Christ has, has claimed the access back. He's reclaimed the access back to earth. All right? So that's where we are right now. Hang on for me. All right. So let's go forward. And it says, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. So Lucifer was in heaven accusing the righteous day and night before the father. But once Christ was resurrected, it says the victory and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah has now come. So now Satan is booted out. He can no longer stand there and accuse us before the Father all of the time. Verse 11, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. So the blood of the Lamb was Christ dying, 
The word of their testimony is what we call prophecy, according to Revelation 19, verse 10. It's prophecy. Verse 12, therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in the woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he had but a short time. Satan honestly believed that he can, he can overcome Christ in Christ his human form. He thought he could overcome him. So, you know, he figured all of these evil angels, because all of the evil angels, I mean, they had focused all of their attention where Christ was. I mean, this is the biggest struggle in all of the universe, and Satan was fighting for his life. He thought it was no way he could lose. He says, therefore, ye heavens and earth, ye that dwell therein, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, for the devil has come down to you. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, remember Christ? Christ is resurrected. Satan is kicked out of heaven. He persecuted the woman who brought forth the man child. Who is the woman? The church. church. Right? Throughout the Bible, uh, the, the Israelites are referred to as the woman. Christ is referred to as the bridegroom. So that's the church, which brought forth the man child. Who was the man child? Christ. Christ. The Messiah. And it says, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she may fly into the wilderness, into her place where she was nourished for a time, time, and half a time from the face of the serpent. All right, so when we look at Bible prophecy, a time, time, and a half a time is 1,260 years, right? And this time period is known as the Dark Ages, where the Roman papal system was, was wrecking havoc across the planet. But look at this church. The church goes to hide. Bible says it's given two wings of the eagle that she might fly in the wilderness into her place. What is the wilderness? This is a term that the Bible often uses when the children of Israel come out of Egypt. They wander around where? In the, in the wilderness. We call that Africa. This is where they hid out for 1,260 years. The true Hebrew Israelites of the Bible. Right? And eventually... The Pope catches up with them. He says, I got you now. So the Bible says that, um, here, let's go to verse 15. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away after the flood. A flood is, is tribulation, problems, suffering, right? Persecution. But what say these Hebrew Israelites from the Roman Catholic Church? Anybody know? The Crusades. The Roman Catholic Church starts to fight against Islam. Islam is sucking up all of their, their men, their resources, their time, their effort. They, they got no time to deal with these Hebrew Israelites. And it says, And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Islam steps in the way. Right? Islam was created by the Catholic Church, but they became independent. Right, They thought that they no longer needed them. Remember, um, the papal Roman system came from the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire divided into two parts. We had the Eastern Roman Empire, which is in a place that, we, that used to be called Constantinople, but it is now called Istanbul. You ever heard of Istanbul? That's the head of, of Islam is in Istanbul, if you didn't know. That's where the, the caliphs who call the shots, they are in Istanbul, in Turkey. They're not in, in, in uh, Kuwait or Saudi Arabia. The, the big dogs who call the shots are in Istanbul, right? So that was really the Eastern Roman Empire. It is a version of Rome. Right, they worship the moon. The Western Roman Empire is represented by the Roman Catholic Church, and they worship the sun, sun worship, moon worship. Just the two things that the Bible always talks about. It has never gone away. All right, and so let's look at the last piece. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. All right, so if the, the heart of these people are in Africa, who are the remnant of their seed? The remnant of their seed are the Protestants who are in Europe, 
and to the and to the um the people like the Waldenses and the Huguenots. These were black people who lived in France and Northern Africa who were heavily persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church and they too kept what everybody? They kept Sabbath. Sabbath. Interesting. Sabbath becomes a, a uh, unifying principle. But we also had other Protestants that, that came out of this movement. People like Martin Luther and others, um, John, John Calvin, John Knox, et cetera, who also were, were connected to this movement, uh, even though they never got a chance to accept the, the Sabbath truth that came along with it. All right, let's get back to the text. Let's get back to the text. We only got a few chapters tonight. We are going to finish chapter 35 tonight. All right, let's pick up with uh, these records, these records. Uh, Sister Rita, are you able to read tonight or no? Sister I'll Rita? be very happy to, and I apologize for missing last Friday to everyone. Oh, no worries, but we'd we'll be glad to have you back, sis. It's good to be back. Uh, it starts with, uh, these records of the past clearly reveal the enmity of Rome toward the true Sabbath and its defenders, and as a means which she employs to honor the institution of her creating. The word of God teaches that these scenes are to be repeated as Roman Catholics and Protestants shall unite for the exaltation of the Sunday. All right, so these things are coming back. Persecution is coming back. I'm telling you, Christ is not going to return without massive persecution before he gets here. And I'm not talking about people not liking you at your job. I'm not talking about people laying you off or just cutting into your, your stipend or your check or your bank account. I'm talking about loss of life. Bloodshed is going to happen here in America. The Roman Catholic Church has, has wanted for hundreds of years to bring bloodshed here. When she is at her strongest she acts like a dragon. When she's weak, she acts like a serpent. Serpents are sneaky, they're conniving, they're sort of, you know, in the grass. But as a dragon, they up high and it's like nothing you can do to them. I could never see he had the dream of the dragon. That is coming again. <sighs> that is coming again here. All right, so Sister Rita, if you can pick up the prophecy of Revelation 13. Hey, Elder oh, could you put it back on? Could you put it back on on the great controversy? You still have it on the on on the scripture. Oh my bad. Yeah, I was trying to follow along. I'm not home. Okay. I don't okay. have my book. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you, okay. sir. Thank you, sir. We're back. All right, Sister Rita, go ahead and read again the last paragraph that you read. The one that starts with these records of the past. Yes, yes they couldn't okay. see it. I'm sorry. These records of the past clearly reveal the enmity of Rome toward the true Sabbath and its defenders and the means which she employs to honor the institution of her creating. The word of God teaches that these scenes are to be repeated as Roman Catholics and Protestants shall unite for the exaltation of the Sunday. All right, they're, the gonna come, they're gonna come together. And what is the name of the movement where Rome comes together with the Protestant churches? What is the name of the movement? The Reformation. Okay. It's called ecumenicism. One of the symbols of ecumenicism looks like this. I'm gonna find it for you. It says coexist. Let me show it for let me show it to you. Hang on. You ever see these these pictures that look like looks like this? You ever see this on people's bumper stickers? Yeah, I can know. Never seen them? Start looking out for them. These are symbols of different religions. This is Islam. This is the Kabbalah, which some Jews follow. This is uh, homosexuality. They call it hum humanitarianism or something like that. Humanist, right? It's, it's actually just homosexuality. This is another form of, of Judaism, right? This is the Kabbalah. This is Judaism. This right here is people from the peace movement. This is yin yang, what's that, uh, Hinduism, and then Christianity. He's saying all of these religions can coexist. Is that true according to the Bible? Can they all coexist? Of course not. The Bible says, how many ways is there to heaven? One, one way. Nimrod, Nimrod created a city, and the name of the city he created was called Babel. And, and Babel means bridge. So Nimrod believed that he could bridge all of the people's different beliefs and they could all get along like Rodney King. 
my Bible says, no, they can't get along. This one says Islam, Buddhism, science. Science is religion, y'all. Judaism, paganism, Wiccan. Wiccan is the religion of witches. It's called Wiccan. And then Christianity. They cannot coexist. Cannot. All right, continue, sis. I'm sorry. Uh, one quick thing, uh, Elder. Come on, brother. Bible is also used as a language. Um, uh, they, they use Babel to learn languages. Right. So when they created the Tower of Babel and God separated them by languages, um, they use that word to uh, create their own movement, Babel. Just like, uh, you know, they use that coexist that you showed and uh, other things too. And the rainbow they used, what destroyed them, they use as their banner, so to speak. That is correct. That is correct. They, they got a, a, an application called Babel, where it does translating in multiple languages. They also used to have a, uh, an app called Dragon Speaking. Remember that? Dragon Speaking? You can talk into your computer and it, it, it types for you, dragon speaking. So it's wow. just like the last thing we need is the dragon speaking, all right? Because that dude ain't got nothing good to say to us. All right. Go ahead, Sister Rita. The prophecy of Revelation 13 declares that the power represented by the beast with lamb-like horns shall cause the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the papacy. There symbolized by the beast like unto a leopard. The beast with two horns is also to say to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast. And furthermore, it is to command all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive the mark of the beast. That's Revelation 13 verses 11 through 16. It has been shown that the United States is the power represented by the beast with lamb-like horns and that this prophecy will be fulfilled when the United States shall enforce Sunday observance, which Rome claims as the special acknowledgement of her supremacy. But in this homage to the papacy, the United States will not be alone. The influence of Rome and the countries that once acknowledged her dominion is still far from being destroyed. And prophecy foretells a restoration of her power. I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wandered after the beast. Verse three, the infliction of the deadly wound points to the downfall of the papacy in 1798. After this, says the prophet, his deadly wound was healed and all the world wandered after the beast. Paul states plainly that the man of sin will continue until the second advent, 2 Thessalonians 2 and 3 through 8. To the very close of time, he will carry forward the work of deception. And the revelator declares, after referring to the papacy, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life, Revelation 13, 8. In both the old and new world, the papacy will receive homage to the honor paid to Sunday institution. That rests solely upon the authority of the Roman church. So a lot of times, you know, uh, Christians read these things in, in, um, in the book of Revelation, and they do recognize that the beast is Rome, right? But they go, oh, we're not following the beast. But then when you understand that the beast's day is Sunday, and, and half of America or, you know, 90% of America are Sunday worshipers. They're following the beast and don't even know it because they definitely not following the Bible. Right. So they follow in the beast because he brought it up over here. It says that um, this beast in the book of Revelation, it looks like a leopard right here. It says um, it says the prophecy of Revelation 13 declares the power represented by the beast with lamb like horns shall cause the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the papacy there symbolized by a beast like unto a leopard. Now, why does the Bible use a leopard as the beast here? Why a leopard? I do have a Bible study on Revelation chapter 13. You can pick 2001, put in my name, Thomas Felder. I'll drop it in the link too. But, but you can go find it. But the reason the Bible says 
that this beast looks like a leopard is that the, the, the priest of Pharaoh, the priest in Egypt wore leper skins. They wore leopard skins. That's what they wore. The priest, they would wear leopard skins. And so the religion of Egypt was sun worship. That was the, its religion, period, end. And so America's religion is sun worship. I mean, everybody from California to Florida and every place in between, all of these Christians all keep Sunday. It's like we brought Egypt with us, just like we got Egypt's pyramids on the back of our dollar bill. We have the Washington Monument, which is an obelisk from Egypt. Some of our main cities are named after Egyptian capitals, Memphis. Um, you have the Luxor down in, in Las Vegas, that... that um, big pyramid, so many of these things, they come from Egypt, all right? So let's continue. Sister Rita, are you up to doing one more paragraph for us? Be happy to. All right. Since the middle of the 19th century, students of prophecy in the United States have presented this testimony to the world. In the events now taking place, is seen a rapid advance toward the fulfillment of the prediction. With Protestant teachers, there is the same claim of divine authority for Sunday keeping and the same lack of scriptural evidence as with the papal leaders who fabricated miracles to supply the place of a command from God. The assertion that God's judgments are vanished upon men for their violation of the Sunday Sabbath will be repeated. Already, it is beginning to be urged and a movement to enforce Sunday observance is fast gaining ground. All right, so the name of the movement that is being used as a vehicle to bring you for Sunday worship is called climate change, climate change. And I know some of y'all are scratching your head. What does climate change have to do with false Sunday worship? Well, the Pope believes that the reason the climate is changing like going on, it's like, because we are no longer following the rules that God has given, right? And that's that's the reason. So as the climate gets worse and worse, as we have more storms and tornadoes and, and, and earthquakes and all these kind of things, he's going to say it's time for us to go back to God as a country. But which God is he talking about? And is it the God of the Bible, right? So you're going to find this happening more and more. In fact, he has a treatise that he wrote. It's called Laudato Si. Laudato Si. You should go read it. You could go. You can find it on the internet. You can Google it. And Laudato Si talks about how, in order to preserve the planet, we must come back to true worship. That's why everybody's talking about climate change. It's the next movement. There's going to be a climate change lockdown. You know, you didn't like the COVID lockdown. Wait till this climate change. How long are you going to have to stay in your house for that to be over? Right? All right, let's continue. Let's see who else we got to read. Um, Sister Linda, can you read? Sister Linda, yeah. um, all right. Since the middle of the 19th century, no, students no, pick up here where it says, did I skip, did I skip a chapter? I, 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 maybe I did. All right, I'm sorry. You're probably at the right place. I could be at the wrong one. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Start with the since the middle. Go ahead, Sister Since, the, since the, the middle one. of the 19th century. It's the next one. All right, forget it. Just let it go. Go, Sister Linda. Go, 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 go. Since the middle of the 19th century, students of prophecy in the United States have presented this testimony to the world. In the events now taking place is seeing a rapid advance toward the fulfillment of the pre prediction. With Protestant teachers, there is the same claim of divine authority for Sunday keeping and the same lack of scriptural evidence as with the papal leaders who fabricated miracles to supply the place of a command from God. The assertion that God's judgments are visited upon men for their violation of the Sunday Sabbath will be repeated. Already it is beginning to be urged and a movement to enforce Sunday observance is fast gaining ground. 
You know, I just want to say, if anybody ever doubts what, what we are reading here about Sunday worship, go find 10 different Sunday pastors in 10 different churches and ask all of them why they keep Sunday and that the Bible says, honor the seventh day Sabbath. And just ask them. I promise you, if you ask 10 different pastors, you'll get 20 different reasons. All right. You'll get 20 different reasons. All right, sis, if you can pick up Marvelous in Her Shrewdness. Marvelous in Her Shrewdness and Cunning is the Roman Church. She can read what it is to be. She bides her time, seeing that the Protestant churches are paying her homage in their acceptance of the false Sabbath and that they are preparing to enforce it by the very means which she herself employed in bygone days. Those who reject the light of truth will yet seek the aid of this self-styled infallible power to exalt an institution that originated with her. How readily she will come to the help of Protestants in this work. It is not difficult to con conjecture. Who understands better than the papal leaders to deal with those who uh, disobedient to the church. Now, is it going to be difficult for the papacy to take over America and our laws and our legal system and, and our military system and our police system? No. Your president right now is a Jesuit. You have Nancy Pelosi, who's the head of the Democratic Party in the House. She's Catholic, you know, and, 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 and key people. I mean, across the whole spectrum, you got... Trump, on the other hand, also brought up by Jesuits. So it doesn't matter whether you go to the left or go to the right. It's part of the same bird, man. It's the same bird. And they're controlling all the shots even now. So you don't have to wait for the Pope to come and, and, and land in Washington and, and go make a speech, man. His people are already running the show. They all be belong to the secret society. That is correct. They all belong to the secret societies as well. So, Ray, so Elder, what, what, yes. what, what, um, okay, so when they try to enforce this Sunday law on the people, what do we do as seven day advents to counteract that? We have to hide? Is that uh, what we have to do? What, what, do, what is it that we need to do? We have an example. Go uh, to the mountains. We have two examples. One is found in, in Daniel chapter three, and the other one is found in Daniel chapter five. In Daniel chapter three, an edict went out from the king, and it went out to everybody in his kingdom, the lawyers, the judges, the sheriffs, and down to the dog catcher, saying, when you hear this sound, bow down. And what did the three Hebrew boys do? Stood up. They got thrown in the fire. What do we do, brother? We learn how to trust, man. Yes, if you can move out the cities, now is the time to do that. But all I would do ultimately is buy you time. So yeah, you want to buy some time, get out the city. But persecution is going to come to every single one of us. Daniel, they told Daniel, if you pray, we're going to throw you to the lions. I mean, they didn't even say go to church, <laughs> honor the sap, pray, you go into the lions. And it's the same Babylon that's running the show, man. Rome is Babylon 2.0. So yeah, Brother Ray, for some of us, we got to learn how to, to live. And for some of us, we got to learn how to die. Easier said than done. Easier said than done. But that's why we have these studies now. You know, it's like a fire drill in some ways. It's like a fire drill. It's those things that you prepare for in times of peace that your brain says it's time to do in times of adversity. All right. So hopefully that answered your question. All right. Where did we stop? The Roman Catholic Church? Okay. Um, who was reading last? Sister Inshai, can you jump in? I don't know if Sister Linda read two paragraphs or not. Sister Linda, you read two, right? Yes. All right. Uh, Sister Inshai, can you pick up for us? Absolutely. History testifies of her artful and persistent efforts. Go back up one paragraph. Oh, okay. The Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church, with all its ramifications throughout the world, forms one vast organization under the control and 
designed to serve the interests of the papal of the papal see. Its millions of communicants in every country on the globe are instructed to hold themselves as bound in a, allegiance to the Pope. Whatever their nationality or their government, they are to regard the authority of the church as above all other. Though they may take the oath pledging their loyalty to the state, yet back of this lies the vow of obedience to Rome, absolving them from every pledge inimical to her interests. So basically, if I am a Roman Catholic anywhere in the world, my allegiance is not to the flag or to my president or to the Senate. It is to who? The Pope. Okay. All right, Sister Enshai, if you can continue. History testifies of her artful and persistent efforts to insinuate herself into the affairs of nations and having gained a foothold to further her own aims, even at the ruin of princes and people. In the year 1204, Pope Innocent III extracted from Peter II, King of Aragon, and the following extraordinary oath. I, Peter, King of Aragonians, profess and promise to be ever faithful and obedient to my Lord, Pope Innocent, to his Catholic successors and the Roman church, and faithfully to preserve my kingdom in his obedience, defending the Catholic faith and persecuting heretical pravity. This is in harmony with the claims regarding the power of the Roman pontiff, that is, that it is lawful for him to de depose emperors mm -hmm. and that he can absolve subjects from their allegiance to unrighteous rulers. All right. So the Pope has three tiers on his papal tiara. On the top tier, he believes that that one represents his ability to control heaven. The one in the middle, his ability to control the earth. And the one on the bottom represents his ability to believe that he believes that he can control the afterlife, which is why he tells you, you can pay an indulgence and he can get your mama out of purgatory, right? He believes that he controls all of these things. He believes that there's no king above him. You know, there was a man named Prince. He was a singer like Michael Jackson. His name was Prince. And he had a song saying um, that he would rather be the Pope you know, I can't remember the name of the song, but in the song, he says, if he could be the president or the pope, he would choose the pope. Lifelong appointment. You have universal power, not limited to some jurisdiction. You are sovereign. You don't even need an army as the pope. You call up other nations to fight your battles. Other nations at your uh, discretion fight your battles. All right. Um, Dr. Jerry, are you able to read tonight? Dr. Jerry going once. Dr. Jerry going twice, three times. All right, Sister Inshai, just pick up for us again. Let it be remembered. And let it be remembered. It is the boast of Rome that she never changes. The principles of Gregory VII and Innocent III are still the principles of the Roman Catholic Church. And had she but the power, she would put them in practice with as much vigor now as in past centuries. Protestants little know what they are doing when they propose to accept the aid of Rome in the work of Sunday exaltation. While they are bent upon accomplishment of their purpose, Rome is aiming to reestablish her power, to recover her lost supremacy. Let the principle once be established in the United States that the church may employ or control the power of the state, that religious observances may be enforced by secular laws. In short, that the authority of, of church and state is to dominate the conscience and the triumph of Rome in this country is assured. All right. So once, once church and state comes together, it's a wrap. You got to understand that Rome has been used to ruling that way for hundreds of years. It was the church and the state. We, we get some protection in this country because there's a separation of church and state. The, the state can't tell your church what to do until recently. We had a COVID 
uh, epidemic and the state told the church, shut down, close your doors, right? So that, that hasn't really happened before in our country. And, and guess what? Nobody stood up for the church. No one stood up for the church. The church immediately became irrelevant overnight. Walmart is still here. Safeway is still here. Every place is still open and running except for the church, man. The church has still not recovered from the state stepping in and telling it what to do. All right, Sister Denise, if you could read the last paragraph for us as we close out for tonight. God's word has given warning of the impending danger. Let this be unheeded and the Protestant world will learn what the purposes of Rome really are. Only when it is too late to escape the snare. She is silently growing into power. Her doctrines are exerting their influence in legislative halls, in the churches, and in the hearts of men. She is piling up her lofty and massive structures in the secret recesses of which her former persecutions will be repeated. Stealthily and unsuspectedly, she is strengthening her forces to further her own ends when the time shall come for her to strike. All that she desires is vantage ground, and this is already being given her. We shall soon see and shall feel what the purpose of the Roman element is. Whoever shall believe and obey the word of God will thereby incur reproach and persecution. Persecution is coming back. That's all I can tell you. And for many of us, it will happen in our lifetimes, man. In our lifetimes. As incredible as it seems, it's coming. You know, it just takes one national calamity for everything to be undone. Just one calamity. You know, last week we were wrestling over toilet paper. Tomorrow we'll be wrestling over gas. And then when there's no more food in the supermarkets, we'll be wrestling over the last can of beans. And they're going to find some way to say it's those people's faults, the people who don't keep Sunday. And trust me, when that kind of thing goes down, everybody says, I keep Sunday, I keep Sunday, I keep Sunday, <laughs> right? Because they're going to want to keep their job. They're going to want to keep benefits. And they're going to, everybody's going to turn into a snitch, man. Your mom is going to call and say, hey, Fred's not keeping Sunday. Your neighbor's going to say, Fred's not keeping Sunday. And so what we read about the Waldenses and the Huguenots is that when Rome says nobody can work on Sunday, they honor that, right? And we will find ourselves honoring when it says you cannot work on Sunday. The great conflict hits ahead when they say that you cannot rest on Sabbath, that you must work on God's Sabbath. That's when the thing comes to a head. And you have to decide, will I be Daniel in the lion's den? Or will I conform and bow down like those peoples on the plains of Dora? That's when you got to make a decision. The time to make a decision is coming soon. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead, Sister Denise. Um, they're currently discussing in Congress the red flag law in light of the killings in, in Texas. The red flag law allows anyone to snitch on you if you have a gun. But like you were saying, um, your neighbors will snitch on you if you're not even observing the Sunday so-called Sabbath. So there's always something in the works behind the scenes that's building toward this uh, Sunday law. Of course. The other thing is the Amber Alert. So you do something, I don't like it, I can call in and now they'll send a text message to everybody's cell phone and on every highway sign saying, be on the lookout for Sister Denise. She's driving a white Toyota Camry tag number, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, they're going to figure this thing out. Your cell phone is tracking you wherever you go. Those fancy new electric cars will shut down on you. The government can say, oh, Fred's in that car, shut it down. And they'll lock you in your own car, Fred. They'll lock you in your own car. That's where we're going, man. We used to look at our cell phones and think that we were studying social media, but our phones are studying us, man. Our phones are studying us. You know, we, we used to um, used to say things like Siri or, or Alexa or whatever, and then they always answer. 
The only way they can always answer is because they're always listening. They're always listening. Yes, they're listening right now. Fred's afraid to talk in his own house, man. Get rid of it. <laughs> I went to visit a cousin in, in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And on Sunday, I asked if we could go shopping. And she said, no, you can't go until after people come out from church, 12 o'clock. Then the stores will open. Well, this is recently? No, this was a few years ago. So now it's probably more rampant. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't doubt it. I wouldn't doubt it. Some people got these ring doorbells and they have told people be careful because they got the ring doorbells and they have the ring video cameras in the house and they know how to reverse engineer your cameras. So people just patch in and watch you like you patch in the Netflix and watch a show. You become the show. Same with the televisions, you know, and even your your laptops like mine is watching me now. And, you know, you got to remember to put tape on top of it. Otherwise, when you don't want it to tape, it's still taping. That's just the world we live in. So anyway, I'm that not so ring, that that ring that you mentioned about the doorbell. Mm -hmm. OK, so once you have one installed, they're all really connected because uh, my neighbor has a ring doorbell. Mm -hmm. And so we saw a bobcat in my backyard and um, I, he has a little dog and I called him. I told him, don't go outside with your little dog when you walk the dog because there's a bobcat back there. He says, yeah, there's bobcats in different parts of the town here, in different parts of the city here because all the ring bells are connected. So they kind of alert each other from that so when you spoke about uh you know uh the sabbath keepers um when when we observe the sabbath and we go out and the people who have ring doorbells will say oh look at ray he's going out to church on this, on, on on the saturday you right know, instead of this instead of the sunday so that's another way of tracking folks so all of these technologies we believe that it's really helping us it's not really helping us like you said it's watching us that's correct hey brother ray when, I get, in my, when I get in my car on sabbath it automatically puts the direction in because it knows where i'm going crazy <laughs> and crazy. there's also have, voice have you? too go ahead I, I, sister rita go ahead again no i was just saying there's also voice identification the automated voice will ask you if you want voice identification and if you say no they say, well, we'll ask you another time. We'll come back and ask you another time. And this is for bill payments and other various forms of using these iPhones oh, and yeah. computers. That is correct. The new iPhones tell, tell you that they can do face recognition even with you having your mask on. Oh. Mm -hmm. And, and they're wow. giving away all of the iPhone 13s. They're giving them away. They're oh, not yes. giving them away for no reason, man. It's facial recognition. So as you walk down the street, these these cameras on top of the street lights and on top of the the lamp posts can zero in on you, man. Zero in on you. They say from satellites, alleged satellites, that they can they can zero in and, and see a penny and, and tell you what year is on the penny. Oh. I know that there's um, something um, on there. Uh, I, I I hear you, Sister Lucy. And I hear another lady voice. So I'll take you and then I'll go to the other lady voice. Maybe that's yeah. Have you have you been having a conversation and then all of a sudden Alexa answers you and tells you what you were going, what you were saying and what you were thinking <laughs> about. Yeah, and then Amazon sends you whatever you're talking about, whatever the product is, it'll show up. It'll show yes. up across Google and YouTube and everything. Talk about your taxes and then it'll bring up tax help companies or talk about your sneakers and Sneakers will pop up, you know, talk about diapers and, you know, it's, we got to get hip. At some point, you're going to have to take this thing and toss it, man. You're going to toss it. They, they, they know you're going to toss it eventually, so they're going to figure out a way to put the phone right in, built in. They're going to put the we'll phone. We'll go back there. to our flip phones. <laughs> yeah, people, no, you can't go back to your flip phones. They cut those off. Those were 3G. Those are now inoperable. They, they're already two steps ahead of you, sis. They're two and a half steps ahead of you. Sorry. Flip phone won't save you. You better try Morse code. <laughs> Morse code. 
All right, Sister Inshai, I think you had a comment and, and then we'll land the plane. Yeah, I was just going to say in regards to like all the social media stuff, there's um, a documentary on Netflix called The Social Dilemma, and mm -hmm. it literally breaks down how, you know, social media works. And even the people who created social media, they don't use it and they don't they don't let their children use it. And that how it literally reads and studies you to keep drawing you in. And it has different forms, just like you said, you know, facial recognition and fingerprints and how it will store all your information. So it's definitely an interesting documentary to, to, you know, take a look at. I agree with you, sis. I, I got off of Facebook for a year now and Instagram. And for those of you who know me, I loved Instagram. I love Facebook posts and things. Congratulations. And got, I'm, on my, I'm on my second year off of Twitter. So yeah, and I'm the exact opposite. I just fight that social media. So I'm, I'm so adamant about not even trying to learn how to operate on all social media. Who cares what you're doing? I don't care. And I don't You win I, the prize. Sir. Yeah, you, you win the prize. But sometimes we have family and we haven't seen them. So it's a good That's way to see true. pictures. And That's true. It does have some benefits, man. But I think that the, the dangers of it, man outweighs some of the good things we got but even of, giving it up they have other ways of finding out what readers do yeah they know exactly what readers do mm -hmm. they do yeah. so wow. we're done for tonight thank you so much we'll be on tomorrow with cover to cover we'll be doing deuteronomy chapter 11 tomorrow deuteronomy chapter 11 6 a.m um brother fred can you pray us out do you mind Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we've been able to spend together uh, reading this important message, dear Lord, to prepare us for the soon coming of your son. Help us, dear Lord, to continue to grow in our faith, to be strong, and to be a good witness for you, dear Lord. When our doors are, are busted down, when the authorities ask us uh, a reason for why we worship on the Sabbath, Help us, dear Lord, to be able to recall the appropriate scriptures and to be, a, again, a good witness for you. We ask, oh, Lord, that you would be with us tonight. Be with those, dear Lord, who have had most traumatic events this week. Comfort them, dear Lord. Uh, bring about your peace that passes all understanding. And we just ask, Lord, that you would grant us a restful night. In Yahshua's name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen again. Thank you so much, Brother Fred. I look forward to seeing each of you at the gates of the kingdom. What would it profit us to gain the whole world and to lose our own soul? Until I meet you and greet you, walk with the king today and be a blessing. Today's great controversy call is officially